closer you were to those centers, the more likely you were to say, yes, I think that we can compete. Get outside those six counties, and the majority of folks do not believe that their county could survive alone. I think we know that, right? Now, Florida is unique. I, there's no other place that I can mention this in the speech, so I'm just going to throw this out here because it's one of the key points that we've got to develop as part of our story and our brand. When you're talking about rural in the rest of the country, you're talking about you've got to drive for days before you get anywhere. When we're talking about rural in Florida, you're only an hour and a half away from one of the most vibrant centers uh, on the, uh, uh, in the U.S., much less across the globe, right? So there's lots of opportunities if we can work together. Florida's history is not necessarily known of county risk uh, and counties or regions broadly working together, but there's hope, particularly if we pay attention to some of the opportunities. We asked a lot of different questions while we were in the uh, town halls, talking to 10,000 folks and asking them, so there are a number of issues that we want to find out. Do you believe these are strengths or weaknesses and are they getting better or getting worse? This is the big map of what came out. You can find it at florida2030.org. I'll have a slide up on that in a little while. But I want to talk about what folks said about Palm Beach in particular. When we were in here and talked to you, it was about 250 folks. Sure, it's a small group, but we tried to make sure that it was representative of the perspective of the region. Most of the folks had actually lived here a long time, which is not necessarily representative of the region, but 20 plus years was the typical person that was responded. And they answered that, for the most part, particularly those things that are in the circle, yeah, they're about right where uh, they think the rest of the state lives. We've got a good education system, yeah, but it could be better. We've got great health care, but there are challenges sometimes accessing it, whether that's because of transportation or because of insurance. Uh, the highest ranking thing in every community, and I'm talking about places that include rodeos as their top cultural event, Floridians believe, by and large, that arts, culture, heritage, and the sense of place is fantastic. And it's a statement about what the true opportunity for Florida is. We've got just about anything that you want, except mountains and snow, right? So we can create those opportunities in one way or another. We feel pretty strongly about most of the things, and Palm Beach feels very similarly uh, to the rest of the state about a number of different issues. I will highlight a few things that are different, though. First, some positive things. Whereas the majority of the state feels that economic development and economic prosperity are weaknesses, Palm Beach felt that both of these were actually up, uh, strengths. And they were pretty positive about the direction that they were going in. There are two arrows on the economic prosperity because there was a recognition that a lot of things are getting better for folks in Palm Beach, but there are still some communities uh, that don't live where we live, don't shop where we shop, don't go to schools where we go to schools that are struggling. We know that about the county. If you don't know that about the county, just lift your head and look around. We can see that just about everywhere. These are the positives, though. We were doing much more favorable than the rest of the state. However, there were some things that stood out as negatives, more so than the rest of the state. Transportation was one of those. To be fair, most people said that the large systems, the structures that connect to the globe, or the rest of the country are pretty good. You can access most of the big system transportation across the globe pretty easily. You just can't get across town. Does that sound familiar? So that might impact or change, by the way, uh, positively or negatively for some of the opportunities that we're talking about in the future. And then, I don't know if you noticed, affordability of housing didn't move. It is the crisis across the state. There is not enough housing at any kind of description that you're talking about, in particular for workforce housing. And that's going to play into the opportunities when you start thinking about the types of folks uh, that you want, that will want to grow or recruit here. The same uh, single parent household with two kids looking for an apartment with uh, one or two bedrooms, uh, because you know this is where they have to survive. They're competing with the young professionals who are looking for those same assets. And by the way, some of the retirees that are moving into the community. It is an engine and a challenge everywhere across the state. One of the reasons I highlight the differences, I didn't think it could get worse. However, in Palm Beach, you proved me wrong. What folks actually thought that it was not only bad, it was a weakness, it was getting significantly worse. And most people did not see a favorable side. They didn't see a lot of growth and development easing this tension. Now I'm going to stop here for just a second.
mostly so that you can stretch your arms, but I'm going to ask a question. Do you believe that that is a true statement? Raise your hand if you believe that affordability of housing is still one of the big stressors in the region. Now, some of you did it because you saw your opportunity to stretch, but I, I, I tend to believe this. This is a crisis. This is an opportunity that needs to be addressed because it will drive the conversation today and it will drive the economic development conversations into the future. Build all the structures you want. Maintain the coastline all you want. If people don't have a way to live in your community, they will not stay in your community, right? It's just one of those realities. And the people who, by the way, leave are the ones who have access and resources to be able to make their changes. So, this is one of those crisis areas that we've got to look at. We asked CEOs across the state, not just Palm Beach, what they thought the findings are in, uh, were published in this month's Florida Trend Report. The good thing is that businesses actually believe this is a great place to be. Uh, they can find the talent that they need by and large. Uh, that they do think that the future looks bright. I love one of the statements uh, that these were, by the way, uh, anonymous interviews. We asked them a series of questions. Uh, they knew that we weren't going to publish their names, so hopefully they were being pretty honest, and I think they were. Um, one of the things that stood out was this one phrase, is that a lot of folks don't want to come to Florida. But once they get here, they don't want to leave, right? And that comes from either whether they're visiting or whether they're coming here and uh, living on a longer-term basis. So let me cover uh, what, uh, in, in a too quick of an overview, what this Florida 2030 conversation evolves into now. We looked at these town halls and these conversations to think about where we were. So if you think about the big picture of context that I laid out before, where Florida uh, is, we're, we're doing well. In the broader context, we, we have a lot of competitive forces. Your region, Palm Beach, is doing well, but it has some opportunities for growth. The town halls told us what people thought about where we were. So now let's start thinking about the future and what some of those changes are going to be. I keep mention, I've mentioned a few times the six pillars. You know, there are a few different things that we have figured out, and in your work you probably know these two, drive economies, the talent base, the uh, investments that you have, either through research and development or economic development, the infrastructure, the governance and the business climate, as well as the quality of life. These are engines to economies. Um, and there are a lot of things that we've got to get right in those areas. Um, I'm not going to cover too deeply, but I do want to highlight some things that are going to be impacted by some changes in the future. I mentioned Florida2030.org. If you want to uh, get a copy of the re first report that we just put out in terms of trends and indicators, some of the things that I'm going to be highlighting, you can go in there and download it. It's available there. You can come to any of the town halls. We'll have regional information as well as some of the, uh, the big pictures. You're not going to be surprised by what it's going to tell you in this sense. The way we live, how we work, and the risks that we are facing are going to be different as we go forward. They're going to be similar in the fact that, as uh, one of my favorite quotes, we were talking about paraphrasing uh, quotes uh, earlier, Paul Harvey used to say, in times like these, it's important to remember that there have always been times like these. Look, there have always been changes that have created disruptions and change. But I do think this one's a little bit different, in part because of the speed and because of the leveling force that it has. Uh, some of the disruptions that are driven by technology, that are driven by the risks that we are facing. Um, Commissioner Smith and I were just talking about water issues and um, coral, and he's got wealth of information about a number of different projects that we have worked on on transportation and community problems. There is no shortage of challenges. It just seems that they're coming uh, more quickly, or we're becoming more aware, and they are evolving much quicker. Part of that is because of the leveling forces or the, the forces that create speed for these things. One thing that I do want to highlight, there are some key elements about responding to tomorrow. This is the only time I'm going to mention it, but it may play into our conversations this afternoon. So just want to make sure that you remember, talent, people, are really at the core of most of the opportunity for tomorrow. The choices that they will make or the people that you are able to keep and retain in your communities are actually going to be a big part of the solution and the opportunities. Value-added economies are still going to be the way that you are going to be able to not only grow, but to preserve what you want to preserve. There is nothing that, there, I, I, I like to say it this way, 
There is no dollar that is applied to a solution that does not start with business in one way or another. So some people say, no, no, government does well. Government gets their money from taxes, and taxes are extracted from people who either uh, earned it through a paycheck or raised it in their business, right? No, no, it comes from people who give gifts. Well, that, that also started in the wealth creation process somewhere else. The way this country works, whether it's philanthropy or in any other gift process, it starts with business. And by the way, those businesses do want to preserve the quality of the community that they're in the quality of the place. I think that that is an important element because if we're going to continue to preserve Florida's future, we've got to find ways to remain competitive. We can argue about that. Some of you may want to fight about that, Artemis, whatever it may be, but this is where I stand on this particular process. Happy to go into that debate somewhere else. Two other things. Connectivity is a big part of it. That came up loud and clear when folks were talking about Palm Beach. They used the word transportation. But there are two other ways that I really want to highlight. That. Connecting across community is one thing, but connecting to the global opportunity is another. There are still parts of Palm Beach County, but definitely about Florida, that cannot take online courses. Did you know that there, you remember that dial-up sound of still happens in a lot of places. Now imagine if your business or your future relied on that. That is still a big part of about 15% of Florida families. Um, and finally, collaborating at the speed of opportunity. If the disruptions and the change is going to come faster than before, then we've got to respond in a faster pace. You can download the report there and find out a little bit more. This is going to be a whirlwind tour. I uh, apologize, it's not going to go very deeply, and I'm not going to dive into everything that's on here. But I do want to give a big picture of some of the things that I think are an important part to talk about. Whether you're in design, whether you're in construction, whether you're in uh, retail, whether you're in whatever the planning of, uh, pro part of the process that you're in from the beginning to the end, or whether you're just a citizen, there are going to be forces that are impacting you and are going to create disturbances, disruptions. Some of those are driven by demographics, the way that uh, the people who live in the state and the folks that are coming are going to change everything from our politics uh, to the needs that we have for developing the next generation uh, to the resources that they provide a community. Hey, some quick things. I mentioned that I was going to uh, highlight where folks are coming from. This is a map, the one that doesn't have Florida in here, is the plus or minus of where we are giving or getting folks. You'll notice that the majority of the folks that we are losing, we're losing to the southeast and to the uh, very far um, northwest. We are gaining from the corridors that you would expect. Walk outside of this building and ask people where they're from, and you're going to find out that they're from New York, from Connecticut, from Illinois. That's not going to be unusual, right? Well, it's because there are a lot of those folks that are coming uh, over the uh, year over year. Where are they going to? Between here and 2030, 5.4 half of the 5.4 million folks that are going to move into the state are going to go into just eight counties. So there are going to be about 6 million people who come into the state. If we follow the current patterns and we believe the projections that we currently have, the vast majority of them are going to be in these eight counties. Oh, by the way, you're on that list. Are you ready for that? There are clearly opportunities, but are we planning for that future? There's, as I mentioned, they're not coming with empty pockets, per se. If you look at it, as at the state level, we're adding $879,000 every hour. No. Uh, I calculated this yesterday, and I forget it at the moment, but it was close to $20,000 some dollars. Um, I'm mean, sorry, $201,000. Anyhow, we've added, we will add $1 billion to our economy in adjusted gross income this year in Palm Beach. Where is it coming from? Well, most of it is moving north from Miami and Broward. But a lot of it is coming from New York, from Connecticut, uh, from Illinois. Right, do these names surprise you? Maybe you're surprised at how much wealth is actually coming in with them. Uh, there's a lot more that you can drill down into. Now, this has a two-year lag. So this data is actually from the beginning of uh, 2016, from uh, uh, the tax reports of 2016, which means it's a 2015 economy. We've actually improved the situation, and as we watch this and look in the rearview mirror, we're going to find some interesting things. 
Some of that is that there's a lot of wealth. The rest of the story is that there's some growing inequalities that we've got to find a way to address. You know about the changes in diversity. Right now, millennials are already the, the biggest part of our uh, workforce across the country, and they are going to project to be a continuing part of that process, right? No surprise there. What's different is that boomers are working longer, maybe in different ways, not in the traditional lifestyles. They're going into encore careers. This is not unusual, and we Xers are going to continue to be stressed and struggle for the rest of our lives. That's why they call us Xers anyhow, so it's okay. This is the pattern across the country. I'm sorry that I moved this. Did I kick that or something? No, I'm good. Okay. Um, I'm just very happy that I haven't tripped on the damn board yet. So, you know, root for me. Like it. But what do we have in Florida? So we are not diversifying necessarily our population as much. We continue, and it looks all the way out to 2040, that about half of the population is going to be in the, the older workforce population. What is that a statement of? We are a statement of destination. We don't reproduce at this rate. We have things that are sometimes unique opportunities like tax bills that get passed at the national level, which makes it a 28% advantage to come and move to Florida right now, right? And by the way, we're going up there and telling them that it's a great advantage to move in right now. So these numbers and these projections of how many folks uh, between here and 2040 are going to be between the ages of 35 and 64. They continue to be the largest part of our workforce. We are adding folks over the age of 60. We're adding folks over the age of 70. We're growing uh, the over 80 population. And the reason I use the word added instead of uh, talking about uh, aging in place is that for some reason, when they're in the 35 to 65 category, they are white, black, and Hispanic. However, when they get into the 70 plus category, they're all white. We know this. There's disproportionate outcomes for folks in minority statuses. Those are some things that we have to address in our communities. But we fill in the slots for the older generation from folks that are moving from other places. That's not an unusual story for Florida. What does change from the Florida story to other places is what are the preferences and styles that these folks have, the tastes that they have, the needs that they have. Um, many of those folks that moved here in the older categories, for example, needed health services. Which category, by the way, did I mention you lost the most jobs in? I think there's an intersect there that we're going to have to pay attention to. You're either going to potentially have a lot of younger folks in this community and you're going to foreclose the opportunity on, the, on uh, the population that, by the way, across the country is going to transfer $30 trillion worth of wealth. Baby boomers handing it off to another opportunity, investing in something and giving it to their family, having it taken from them, I don't know, in what way if possible, but are you going to be part of capturing that opportunity? I have changed the color of the background just really to highlight this is not from my side of the shop. The Florida Chamber Foundation is not a political part, but we do have a political part. They shared this slide with me because I want to highlight where we are. As a state, when we add a lot of folks, it has consequences. From a political perspective, what we are adding, I'm sorry, the OCD and me is going to kill me on this one, so I'm going to just keep looking on this screen. So, what we are adding is a lot of folks who like registering as no party affiliation. Fantastic, no problem. I don't care what party you are, actually, it doesn't really matter anymore. I don't know what any of them stand for in any case. But we, what we have in this state right now is that the largest party are Democrats. The second largest grouping is no party affiliation, and the third largest grouping is Republicans. And more and more people, month over month, are registering as no party affiliation. Does that matter? I don't know. Maybe. What does matter is these little numbers that are on the left-hand corner here. It doesn't have a key because I want you to listen to how it, this is described. If you go, uh, Governor Scott, you probably know, was elected uh, about eight years ago. So within the last eight years, you think about the folks in a community, one out of whatever the key color is, that many folks were not here before he got elected. So take Osceola County, this spot right here. 
one out of every two folks were not part of a prior election. Take Palm Beach. One out of every three folks were not part of an election process in Florida prior to Governor Scott being elected. This is not about Governor Scott. This is a story that says, hey, if you want to talk about zoning, or you want to talk about community change, or you want to talk about what your community is supposed to look like, you cannot start from the baseline. Remember back when we were in high school and dot, dot, dot. You can barely talk about, remember when they did the last I-95 project. Because these folks weren't part of those solutions. This is not part of their story. If you want to talk about community change and redesigning buildings and downtowns and regional activity, none of these folks, one third at least, did not participate in this conversation with you. Do you sense that? Do you feel that? Do you ever go to a town hall meeting and say, what, what's going on here? That is the story of Florida. Everybody comes in with their own dreams. Everybody comes in with their own expectations. If we do not pay attention to the forces that they are bringing to the table, if we design based on the way that we've designed in our community for the last 20 years, we are not really addressing necessarily the needs, usually, of about 30% of the folks up here. Their Florida is the Florida that was existed. Their community was the one that existed the day that they walked in. Right? Is that going to make a difference in the tabletop exercise? I don't know. Maybe you're already considering that. But this is part of what's going to drive some of the conversation. So in addition to uh, demographics, technology. We happen to go anywhere and not talk about the, the forces of technology making this, particularly the trifecta of uh, automation and sensors and artificial intelligence. What we have created is an economy, by the way, that doesn't need humans, when you really think about it. They can make their own choices, not only just turn left and turn right, but how to create something, design it, distribute it, get it to wherever it needs. So when we're talking about retail, we're talking about human choices, and yet uh, we are creating a world that's not going to need humans for a big part of it. And this is part of that leveling force that's happening in emerging economies. By the way, this is a very good point to emphasize. Eighty-some percent of the folks were optimistic about the future of Florida. I suspect that most of you were. You wouldn't have gotten out of bed at 7 or 8 uh, in the morning. You started as, how many of you started as optimist, optimistic about the future of Florida this morning? <coughs> Maybe some of you lie and we just don't want it. It's all right. It's, it, it's okay. Most of us are optimistic. I want you to leave optimistic. So when I start talking about the fact that humans aren't going to be a big part of the economy, don't get scared. It's just one of those things that when I say that we've got to make, take, make sure that we have a disproportionate share of the opportunities and a disproportionate share of talent, it's that if we want to compete, if we don't want to become obsolete, we've got to be thinking about that now. It goes into our design decisions, right? So if quality of life and quality of place is, and by the way it is, one of those decisions that people use to make their choices about tomorrow, what do we do to make sure that we are making, uh, uh, capturing a disproportionate share of talent and opportunities? We know that the nature of work is changing. Today, half of all jobs can be automated in some way. Even professional jobs, by the way. Accountancies and lawyers are already losing their jobs to artificial intelligence. Those are rule-based systems. Is design rule-based, by the way? Could you potentially put much of the information in there? Or could you transfer things maybe overseas and have the design build process start somewhere else? These are some of the challenges. It's not just automation. It's not just food service workers being displaced because robots are coming in and cooking and delivering food. It's not just truck drivers potentially being displaced by autonomous vehicles or taxi drivers being replaced by some shared economy tool, right? This is every single position. Remember, we're optimists, we're going to stay optimistic. These are realities that everyone is dealing with. We can find ways to get ahead of this process. The adoption rate of whatever comes out has sped up. Twelve years ago, most of us would not be thinking about carrying a large, how many of you had one of those large phones that you remember the ones that you would put in your car? You had one? Do you have shoulder issues now? Because those were amazing things. But now, Try to think about going somewhere without the, uh, the largest store of information in the globe, in your pocket, right? How many of you have a, uh, a, a smart device, uh, a smartphone particularly, but any other device like that on you? 
really, if you don't, what kind of person are you? What the hell are you doing? Are you in the right place? Are you participating? In so, in addition to not only having access to everything in the globe, you are providing information about everything that you do and everything that is your taste and where you're going. Should that scare you? I don't know. Maybe. The reality is, those are realities. That's the world we live in. The adoption rate for technology is speeding up, and that will include artificial intelligence, that will include automation, and it will not always be something that advantages humans. So the nature of work is going to change radically. Globalization has been a force that we've been dealing with for a little while, but automation is going to deal, uh, be a big part of that. Drone deliveries of goods, 3D printing of opportunities. Today, there are concepts that just don't make financial sense or regulatory sense. But someday they might, right? Is it going to happen within the next 10, 15 years in the period that we're going to be talking about at design now? Probably, right? Virtual reality. How many of you remember holodecks from Star Trek or any of those movies, right? Where you can walk in and the experience is there or food is created on the spot. Those are not foreign concepts. Those are things that can happen to some degree right now. Fully immersive experience. Should we worry? Well, yeah. I guess we should worry. But more importantly, we should prepare for the changes that are going to happen in the nature of work, in how we live, where we live, and even how we define prosperity. We know that tomorrow it's still going to be about non-routine cognitive jobs. We're going to need 1.8 billion new jobs across the globe. By the way, if we're Florida going to add somewhere close to 1.7 million folks, we're going to need about, I'm sorry, if we're going to add something close to 5 million folks, we're going to need about 1.7 million jobs. 1.7 million jobs out of 1.8 billion that are going to be created. What percentage are we going to capture? Which jobs do we want? Some of the futures that we have coming up will change the nature of those jobs, but there's opportunities in all of them. The markets across the globe are evolving. The workforce here is not necessarily. So this is what the chart currently looks like. The majority of the folks are between um, uh, your labor force particularly, are right in the sweet spot of 35 to 54. If you remember the chart that I showed you all the way to 40, because we add folks and this is a destination, this pattern persists. What's different is what we need. So if you look at what the projections are, there's no way you're going to be able to read this. But this chart talks about um, the fastest growing by percentage, the jobs that are, are needed in Palm Beach. Number one, trip, uh, interpreters and translators. Then you've got home health aides and physician assistants and, you know, the types of things you would expect to see, including nurse practitioners, occupational therapists. These are the ones that need to grow between here and 2025, according to state projections. Most of these require some level of degree, associates or above, some, some certifications. However, what's likely to be growing, according to the current projections in the state, in terms of the, the most uh, numbers, most jobs, retail. Number one growing opportunity projected between here and 2025, food prep, leisure services. Registered nurses is on here, but most of the others are either less than a high school degree or high school degree or some post-secondary vocational training. By the way, that's not a bad word. A job isn't good if it provides you some opportunities. But many of these things that are working at this level, remember that chart that I showed you about automation and the changes that are coming? These are the jobs that can disappear. So if this is what your community is projecting or is projected